Stone by Stone On a mountain near the desert, far and miles away, I was born to sturdy people colored as of clay. Our people combed the mountainside for food among the bluffs. Foragers and hunters born, resilient and tough. Our mountain blessed us with its gifts. It almost was enough. The hermit lived above the village, hidden in the trees, and we avoided him in fear of catching his disease. It's for this reason every person left the man alone. He was dangerously maddened to the marrow of his bones, for his desire was to eat the mountain stone by stone. Until it was no more, he'd eat the mountain stone by stone. Near the fires, late at night, while something fragrant stewed, we'd thank the mountain for the gift it gave us in our food. Then we would laugh and point at rocks and smile in our mirth, weighing meat and rocks for each their salubrious worth. The hermit truly lived upon the bounty of the earth. But only children laughed about the hermit in this way, mocking him, a character oft referenced in our play, imagining an ugly lean-to old man underneath, chewing on the mountain with a mouth of broken teeth. Our laughter tumbled down the mountain towards the barren heath. The elders, on the other hand, went quiet at our wit, and his existence was a thing they barely would admit. None would stop his playing, they'd just look from girl to boy, impassiveness a camouflage their faces would employ, staring at us strangely, as if jealous of our joy. If they could trade their haunted eyes for naivete, for youth, could once again be innocent of some unsettling truth, and innocence was lost to them on reaching elderhood, a casualty to growing up no child understood, if they could trade their eyes to bring it back to them, they would. Nonetheless, our mountain dwelling remained unmolested, if the hermit would succeed was thoroughly untested. My friends and I grew up, and in our hearts we'd always know our home would keep us safe from desert down below, a desert stretching ever out where nothing green could grow. Adolescent now, and feeling wiser in my years, I feel a stir of understanding for my elders' fears. While kids would mock this troubled hermit living on the lamb, they must have learned to pity him, yes, pity the old man, for struggling with his mental burden. Yes, I understand. And suddenly our japes about him were no longer fun, for I could see him breaking teeth on boulders in the sun, baking on the mountain with a meal of stone he hid. He knew he had to do it, but he knew not why he did. While my friends were laughing, these thoughts came to me unbid. I called a friend beside me, and I told him what I'd learned. I could see him thinking, see the wheels inside him turn. We have to find this man, he told me. We have to bring him home. I see now we must save the hermit, connoisseur of stone. He laughed and left me. I should have left well enough alone. I sulked, embarrassed, feeling like the butt end of a joke. And yet I felt its truth in the suggestion that he spoke. I stood, convinced. I had to save him. Of that I was sure. I would save this lonely hermit, piteous and poor. I couldn't think of why no one had thought of this before. I packed a blanket, flint, a weapon, everything I'd need. If it took a year to find him, I knew I'd succeed. I didn't tell a soul about the deed that I would do, yet all the elders watched me as if chillingly they knew. Nonetheless, I climbed the mountain. I would follow through. As I walked, I planned the journey, the expected year, knowing where the hermit dwelled was certainly not near. I'd eat the snow for water and hunt every other day, searching crag and forest, the whole mountain I'd survey. Thus I startled when I found him half a mile away. Where I had sought a crazy man of gray and broken tooth, the man who sat before me was a dark and stoic youth. Calmly, he looked down on me and fixed me with a stare. He sat atop a boulder, seeming totally aware. Uncertainly, I wondered, was he waiting for me there? This couldn't be the hermit. That was plain enough to see. I was young, and he was maybe twice as old as me. I laughed and waved politely as I turned to the unknown. I'd seek the hermit now and leave this stranger on his own. And that was when he asked me to select for him a stone. I stopped in place and turned around. I looked back to him stunned. Though not what I expected, he was certainly the one. It was he that I should save. To that end I was bound. Pity overwhelmed me and my eyes fell to the ground, where I noted sadly there was little stone around. In fact, there were but three stones there, all lined up in a row. The largest one looked like our mountain, naked of its snow. I could barely lift it, but I came to the conclusion when he broke his teeth upon it, he would wake from his delusion. He'd come back with me home and put an end to this seclusion. He nodded, thanked me for the gift I gave him in his food. 
His mouth began to water. I could see it as I viewed. He lifted stone to mouth. The thing was bigger than his head. I winced, anticipating, screaming, filling me with dread. And then he ate the stone. It yielded soft to him like bread. He ate with vigor, hungrily, and to his meal he plunged, and all the while it yielded to him softly like a sponge. Pebbles tumbled down his face as if they were but crumbs. He ate a stone as easily as I would eat a plum. I knelt before him, terrified and broken, overcome. I beheld our mighty mountain. When did this begin? I looked around and had to wonder how big had it been. I pleaded with the monster, please don't take away our home. What do you desire? I'll give everything I own. But his desire was to eat the mountain stone by stone. Until it was no more, he'd eat the mountain stone by stone. My eyes shone then with horror like the elders down below. A desert that surrounded us where nothing green could grow. Devouring a boulder he set on with his greed. Weapons useless, powerless to stop him from this deed. I left the hermit fearing that one day he might succeed.